name is Max Rogers, I'm the, the Executive Director of the Neurological Alliance. Um, I'm going to hand over very quickly now to Dr. Niall Hensler, the person for brain health, and enjoy your report. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's great to see such huge numbers, and it's great to have to change the venue today because of the interest in this video. It's something that we're delighted to see happening. I only have to speak to you for a very few moments, just to, to a few thank yous, I suppose. I'm going to start by thanking our very distinguished panel of speakers that we have today. They've given up their time. You're the very busy people, and I'm very grateful for their time coming to talk to us this morning. I'm also very grateful to our colleagues in the European Brain Council who have come over to talk to us. They've been very supportive of the Irish Brain Council in the last few years, and we really appreciate that. Thanks also to Novartis for helping us uh, today and for sponsoring this event. I'd also particularly like to thank Max Rogers for organising and all the work that she has done in being able to support the event today. So very briefly, the Irish Brain Council is a representative uh, organisation of bodies that are interested in promoting brain health and brain research in Ireland. Um, we have worked very closely with our European colleagues and we're with the aim of promoting quality of life for people living with brain conditions in Ireland. Uh, we began by having a mission, as you can see here, to promote brain research, but as is entirely appropriate over the last few years, we broadened that to promoting brain health and promoting a clinical strategy in Ireland for developing uh, clinical services for people with brain conditions. Our sole aim really is to try and improve the quality of life, the services, the care, and the treatment of patients with brain conditions hopefully have a single strategy for all patients across the, the island where we can begin to understand and treat patients with, with uh, complex brain conditions. Last year at our inaugural conference and this week produced and launched a position paper outlining the um, points that we want to achieve from the Irish Brain Council. I think you're going to be circulated with a link to this as part of your attendance today and there are some spare copies floating around as well. So hopefully you get a chance to see this, read this, and take this on board. And we're looking forward to collaborating with more people, more organisations, with the aim of developing this, these services and improving the uh, quality of life of people with brain conditions. So, um, without further ado, I will step back and hand you over to our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Presenting on the, the Neurology Patient Experience Survey that, was, that they did in collaboration with Neurological Alliance of Ireland, um, and also on the Neurology Programme and its aims and the progress that it's made. So if I can pass over to President Janet Dean now. Thank Good. Okay, Dean is going to join me. She does all the work. Um, thanks for the invitation. And uh, so, Neurology. Um, I thought we could probably I'd ask more what that is, because often sometimes I ask around nursing staff, what do I do? So they don't know what I do, but what is neurology? Um, how many neurons in the brain? Let's ask Professor Robertson that question. Wake him up quickly. <laughs> how many neurons in your brain, Professor Robertson? <laughs> yeah, about a million. It's amazing, isn't it? And then you have all those connections to synapses. So is it important? Well, apparently it is important. What's interesting is it's not very important in education. So anybody got any kids in school? Teenagers doing the junior cert. <coughs> you check the science journal for your teenager doing the junior cert. I just did it yesterday. My 11 year old was doing heart, kidney, lung, blah, blah, blah. Can you find the word brain once? <laughs> eh, not in the junior cert. It's got dropped from the curriculum, which is a problem. And it's a problem for us because I've, and maybe Dean's fine, we've run into this deep ignorance, maybe Ian might come on that. In Ireland, there's a deep ignorance about the brain. Of the black box. And the problem that pervades society, and it pervades the civil servants, and it pervades the agency, and the Department of Health and the Department of Finance, etc. So they don't give money to brain and brain disorders and brain research because the concept isn't there. It's kind of important, and we know a lot about it, about the neuroscience, but the importance of those 100 billion neurons, the importance of exercise, and by keeping us well, the importance of sleep, the importance of nutrition, all that data is there, but is that actually translated into, into the population and the kids? No. Um, I'm kind of thinking at this stage, we probably need to tackle the next generation so that they understand how to look after the brain. So you can avoid or delay the onset of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, etc. Because that's all possible with neuroscience at this stage. It doesn't get taught. And it's kind of interesting, you do give a talk to kids, and I gave a talk to about 120, 11 year olds recently, they really enjoyed it. There, lots of questions got up, and you ask a lot of very good questions that are Nobel Prize winning questions. And sometimes I say, I don't know the answer. So they're interested in it, but we don't teach them. And we don't think of our look after brain. And the problem then is, healthcare often concentrates in other areas of medicine, 
which are not of importance. But they get you know, greater amounts of money, perhaps from the issue. And I'm going to pick them with you. There are common things in, in Irish health care, lots of funding, and other areas of medicine and some of the brain disorders don't get. So that's what we do. We deal with neurological problems. That's what I do, and as an neurologist. Um, and that's a common area. Uh, if you look at the figures of this thing, and there's data coming from Mary Gilbert Quinn from Europe, and they looked at the commonest causes are expense to Europe. How much does brain and mind disorders cost Europe per year? This is data from six years ago. Any volunteers? 100 million? A billion? I would guess. A <coughs> billion, you say it is. It's 800 billion. That's what it costs them per annum. And you're the top 10 disorders in that. You'll certainly find depression and schizophrenia, but you also find headache, you find Parkinson's, you find stroke, you find epilepsy. All these disorders are pretty common. In Ireland, about 700,000 people are in the country with neurological problems. The vast majority are headache, as Audrey knows. So headache is pretty common, and it disables people when they miss work, etc. But then there are other more nasty disorders in some ways, because they're degenerative ones and they kill you. So Parkinson's, stroke, uh, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, etc. Uh, and if you add all those together, both in the primary healthcare system, about one in seven patients coming to primary healthcare will have a neurological problem. And about one in five medical conditions will have a neurological problem. So it's common. It's relevant to acute medicine and also chronic medicine. But often doesn't get actually addressed, which is frustrating. Part of our job, I suppose, of the program is to do that. I'm not sure we've achieved that. Um, I think we've had some successes. But the program works within the program office. And there have been frustrations with that. But I mean, our main aim really was a couple of things. This has been going since 2009. Started with Brian Sweeney as the clinical lead initially, and then I took it over, and I'll be stepping away from that shortly. And then the dean has been one of the show base. We've been working by ourselves with epilepsy and rehab. Our main thrust is trying to increase access. Uh, we think, and the patient survey that Mags will refer to, I think is very important, that actually the care we give within hospitals isn't bad. I think we haven't integrated it correctly fully yet in the primary care system yet. That's true. Um, but that's complex. It will be difficult because. Neurology in medical school, and perhaps you know, I should say in nursing school, is not even taught at all. I've asked that as a third year a nurse in the matter recently and said, What neurology have you been taught? She said, Eh. And so she's a third year nursing and she's had no neurology training at all. And she'd be on the board saying, You have to be with neurology problems. That's a problem. Um, so we have a problem. Uh, and our role here was to try and increase access. We felt that our caregiving probably wasn't bad, it wasn't perfect, but it was once you got to hospital. So how do you increase access? And how do you make it equitable? Because the country is patchy. Like everything that's going to be tilted, most of it's gathered around Dublin, and the same applies in healthcare as well. But then there's lots of other people around. And we recognize, if you look at the Northwest, we have one of in Sligo, God help them, looking after Sl Mayo, Sligo, Donegal, and Ross Common, etc. on his own. So poor man was a good one. And then in the middle, Midlands, there was no neurology at all at one stage. Monagar, Tullamore, uh, etc. Nace, uh, etc., etc., etc. Et cetera, et cetera. No neurologists at all. So that's a problem. If you have an acute neurological problem, you're in patient those hospitals, that can be difficult. You don't get a diagnosis, you don't get a diagnostic treatment, then presumably you may not get better. So there are, there are deep holes. We were, our role in the program is trying to improve. So that's kind of the background. I'm going to hand over to Dina to take it from there. We do want to check it. Um, thank you very much, Dina. Um, so as, as you mentioned in the clinical program, the we have made some significant gains, not as many as we would like to. But one of the big things we did do was launch a model of care towards the end of 2016, which is kind of like a blueprint or a framework for how neurology services should, should be developed across the country. Um, and I suppose one of the real reasons we wanted to work with NAI to do the patient experience survey was to try and get a, an idea of the baseline. What is patient experience like now? And then as we move towards implementing the model of care and the recommendations within it, to then be able to repeat an exercise to see, well, actually, did it make a real difference to patient experience? It, it may make a difference to waiting times and all that, but did it, would it make a real difference to patient experience? So we were grateful at the opportunity to work with NEI to circulate the, the patient survey. And I think we had some really useful, relevant feedback. And I know it was over 200, 272 respondents, so it was quite a good return rate, really. Um, so how are we doing? I suppose, just as well as Tim was saying, the survey looks like patients. Um, we chose our patients because access is a big, huge issue, but really, <coughs> care of somebody with neuro neurological condition crosses all of the divisions across the 
trust with the total social care, primary care, hospitals, and any kink in any one part will have a direct impact on another. So, although we only looked at outpatient services for this, um, we are very aware that all of the services need to work together to, to support the whole community. How are we doing? As we said, access is one of the things that we were really interested in hearing about. This is what the survey respondents said. Um, within, within the speaking respondent, 50% of them were seen in less than three months, which is, which is good, and that meets the, the national target, which would be that all your referrals are seen within 90 days. Um, there's still a significant amount of people not being seen within that, within that time frame. Um, so we want to have a look and see really how does that equate to nationally, you know, not just the survey respondents. So we have here, we have some slides from August 2012 compared to December 2017. We're not quite meeting the 50% on a national scale. I think maybe the, the people who responded have particularly good experiences, but we, we are doing better than what we were. What we're really doing a little bit better at is that big group of people who are waiting over 12 months. <laughs> so we have brought down the okay, have brought down the number of people waiting really in order makes of time to get into serve the, get into a service. And I suppose the real the outpatients, your diagnosis is your key to everything else. You know, it's your key to therapies where they exist, it's your key to treatment, it's your key to diagnostics, all that. So that's why access is such a Huge issue. I just comment on that. I mean, it's interesting. 2012 is, is the blue one, so waiting up 12 months was pretty substantial. So we've done something in that. Uh, you can get see a neurologist quicker. It's not perfect. It's better than it was. Um, and the, the point made is it's crucial. Diagnosis, particularly in the specialty, is is key. Um, it's key in all specialties, but it's often a bit more complex in neurology. It does. There's a thing called neurophobia within medical schools and nursing schools that people get scared about neurology and often don't know about that, refer on, so there's no diagnosis made. And if you don't make a diagnosis, you can't start therapy. So that's part of it. What we do often, people are not aware of it, when a neurologist sees you or sees a patient, they're kind of going through two processes. They want to, first of all, where is it in the nervous system? Um, is it brain, is it brain stem, is it spinal cord, nerve root, plexus, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, or muscle? So it gets anywhere in the whole body. That's actually a huge amount of areas within the, the system that can go wrong. So that's the first thing, and our history and exam is all key to that, to try and pin down where we think the problem is within the axis. And then number two is, what is it? And that goes to a list of things in our brain, and the most neurologists methodically would go through that, and you'll see them working through this with the diagnostic test. Is it inherited? Is it infected? Is it nutritional? Is it endocrine? Is it trauma? Is it vascular? Is it immunological? Is it degenerative? Is it a tumor? Is it iatrogenic? Induced by medication, which is unfortunately very common, um, is it metabolic or is it a psychiatric disorder? So that's kind of we pop, 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 pop. And the problem then is you generate a list of possible causes. And the problem in neurology actually, we have more diagnosis in neurology than the rest of medicine put together. Uh, when you look at the diagnostic list, they just go on and on and on and on. Uh, so that's the problem. So often you find people are hunting away to a detailed history, and people who often complain about that, people often find they're given the same history over and over again. But people are doing this methodically, trying to do that process to pin it down um, detective-wise, and then do the investigations to confirm your diagnosis. So that, this was one of the follow-up questions that I'm waiting time, was the impact on patients. Are people overly concerned about their waiting times? And again, within the group, 50%-ish, we're okay, we're not overly concerned, but then the rest were, we're worried about the impact of having to wait and to get back into, into outpatient services. But it is something that we need to look at. What's the problem? Why, why are waiting times so long? This is very, very important. Basically, one of the significant issues is the number of neurologists that we have. Um, the ABM would recommend that there should be one um, neurologist every 70,000 patients. Um, we have about, in the worst uh, resource area, it's one to 200,000, the rest of the country is around one to 180,000 people. So um, even if all of the neurologists we have are working in outpatients, 
all the time, we would still not be on top of this. So when I started, um, which I won't say how long ago, I was the 11th neurologist in the country. Uh, we're about 36 or 37 at the stage, so uh, that's bumped up. Uh, we're better than we were. Um, our numbers have gone up, and I think we're, we clearly are seeing more patients, which is good, hopefully. Uh, but there's a gap. Um, and this becomes more relevant and, I suppose, focused in, in many ways. Uh, 30 years ago, in neurology, you make a diagnosis, but there's limited things you could do. Uh, but nowadays, that's different, um, whether it's therapies for migraine, whether it's to sadly for MS, which is basically very effective. So we've lots of therapies you can treat. So the problem is if you're waiting for a diagnosis of MS somewhere in the Northwest, and it goes by a year, year and a half, you use a, you use a year, year and a half of therapy. And then if you lose brain, you lose brain. And the problem is losing brain tissue is not usually that reversible. It's a bit reversible, but not 100%. So this is key. It's an urgent, rapid access in some fashion for critical conditions because the therapies are increasingly there. And this is going to become more focused and more pointed over the next five years. I'm an optimist. I think we're going to have a whole series of therapies that are going to be biologically based that will have impact on different disorders, including neurodegenerative disorders. I think the science will drive that. So Parkinson's, I can see that happening sometime probably in the next five years. Uh, and other areas like Huntington's, et cetera, which in animal models are, can be treated by gene therapy, et cetera, et cetera. The spinal muscular atrophy story in the last year is kind of remarkable. At a meeting last year I was at, which is a boring bunch of neurologists, I should mention they're all just tend to be obsessive compulsive. We also have a higher frequency of Tourette's, actually, which Ian may want to comment on that, so we twitch into various things. So the neurologists together are a boring bunch, uh, but there's, so there's a bunch of boring neurologists, about 2,500 at this meeting in the States, and presentation given, and they stood up and gave them a standing ovation, which I've never seen. It was because he was showing videotapes of kids with a form of motor neuron disease, inherited form called spinal muscular atrophy, with two forms of therapy, gene therapy, and the last video was the child walking with a rucksack, and these kids never walk. And so it's impressive, and that does work if you got in early enough with it. So that's a, a chink of the armor. Times are changing, so we'd have to meet that demand. Spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, type one, two, three, unfortunately, there we go, those list of diagnoses, but you'll find within that, and there are patients in Ireland getting that treatment. The next thing is the number of patients being referred into neurology services. Um, in the last four years, it's been over 50% increase in the number of people waiting, and over the last eight years, it's been 100% increase. So in 2010, there was 9,217 patients waiting in neurology services, whereas last month there was close to 20,000. So the prevalence of urological conditions is ever increasing, as well as the population is aging as well. So we were very concerned about this at the time the program was put together. We said there could be an iceberg effect here, and it's kind of poo pooed. We said we're seeing the tip, and when we start meeting the demand and seeing offering more services, then more will get referred, and that's what's happened. And we could have, we anticipated this, we kind of knew what happened. Uh, we get a lot of patients with neurological problems just weren't referred, and in particular, for example, I mentioned headache and migraine often, that hasn't been something that has been managed that often with neurology, and that's increasingly needs to be done. So that's what happened. The iceberg has begun to appear. And I guess this slide is just to show that the number of people waiting is not in any way reflected on the fact that, you know, patients aren't being seen and the activity in the neurology OPD services has grown year on year on year. There are more and more patients being seen, um, even though there are, haven't been any significant increase in resources since 2009. Um, the population is just growing and growing and growing. We blame Neil Tupperty and Vince's for this mainly. I think you know Neil, he's a bit mad. So Neil set up a clinic that actually runs three day, three times a day for five days a week. Uh, so they actually just see hundreds of thousands of patients. Uh, it's incredibly efficient, but it must exhaust the poor neurologists. None of us can manage that. You get burned out actually, because it gets complex. When you're dealing with complex patients, three times a day are definitely a gin and tonic in the valley at the end of the day. And I think looking into other reasons, well, as to, as to why there's so many people waiting, one of the theories thrown out was maybe, you know, the number of DNAs, but actually DNAs are quite low within neurology services. Um, it's a flex. Right, but 15%. Yeah. But if there's something wrong with your brain, people do get worried. It's funny, it's kind of ignored nationally, education-wise, but when we have our own brain trouble, boy, does the focus the mind to get the problem. People do turn up, actually, uh, particularly to the whatever, MS, Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, whatever happens to be, you turn up, that's what really happens. Um, another issue, or another 
thing that we really want to look at is further development like we have in epilepsy services and, and lots of other services, MGT and nurse-led clinics. Um, that's very difficult when no neurology centre has a full MGT. So if we can see this is what came back in the survey, that 90% of people were, they had their appointment with a neurologist, not with a clinical nurse specialist or <coughs> they were seen by the consultant. Um, when in other, in other areas, like I'll give epilepsy as an example, where we do have a cohort of advanced nurse practitioners, a, a huge number of the review patients are managed through the nursing service, the nurse-led service, um, which leaves the more refractory cases and the new appointments, the, the consultant sees those. And of course, the, you know, the nurse can refer back in if the person's presentation changes at all. But we, we need to start looking towards that model like I said, even if every neurologist we had in the country was working in outpatients flat out, we're not going to get on top of this. The thing I point out here is that it just there's no one unit in the country has a full team, and in particular as with neuropsychologists from Niall Penry and Robertson, you guys don't seem important, uh, they're not getting appointed in the clinical service, which is a big problem because if you're dealing with neurodegenerative disease and cognitive impairment, often this is a very important assessment to help guide the diagnosis. Uh, I think this is reflects often this is you're looking for excellence in healthcare. And the MDT approach really is the way to do this. I think all articles just popped in. I think it's a good example of that, where in motor neuron disease and full team, patients do better and often less morbidity, and there's some data about less mortality. So actually putting an MDT team is crucial for neurological care and you're looking for excellence, which is really what we should be aiming for. Um, this is another interesting slide when we're looking at things like value as well. And this is something that could be achievable without a significant investment in resources. And it's cohorting patients when they are inpatient, whether it be for elective or you know, an exacerbation or whatever, cohorting them on the one ward um, has been shown to lead to a very significant reduction in average length of stay. And I suppose if patients are cohorted on one ward, then the other staff that are working with the nurses and the OTs and physios and everything develop the expertise around. Um, around managing those patients. It's very simple things that make a huge difference, like meds on time for Parkinson's and people feel that very often when patients are admitted to general wards, their feedback would be that they felt that they had to explain what their condition was to some of the hospital staff who were working with them. To comment that, one of the things we noticed in the program, we try to borrow good practice from other units and copy it elsewhere. So there's different models. And so, for example, some that are most concentrated in outpatients, between St. Vincent's is a good example, are very efficient at that. But their inpatient service perhaps a bit less. Whereas in Bowman Hospital, for example, they give a very big inpatient service that really often bring, brings in patients nationally for acute neurological care, which is crucial. Um, and Cork does the same. At the matter, we had a smaller inpatient service, but had been aiming to try and increase it for many years. But really, the critical mass of the model just wasn't there up to more recently. But we did get there. So we've got six or various bits of six dollars to the matter at this stage. And we introduced a new system, uh, which is this little line here, which was that um, we do a morning report. All the consultants and all the teams meet at 10 every morning after the call the night before. And we model this what's done in the States, where often uh, at 9 o'clock or 10 in the morning, where you would meet the chair of the department and go through all the consults or admissions the night before for discussion. So this is kind of an efficient system, and then what happens is all, all the services meet, and it's a 20, 25 minute meeting, and then there's redistribution of the problem. So if the patient has a GI problem, it goes to GI. If it's a neurology problem, it goes to neurology, cardiology, cardiology, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of that, introducing that, we just look, the numbers of inpatients under neurology care, of course, bumps up, as in the blue bars. So we're looking after more inpatients, which can be up to 30. So our service now looks after acute stroke, and acute inpatient neurology. We also have the consult service, in other words, we see patients under other doctors' care in the hospital and give an opinion on them, which seems to be as busy as ever. But as a result of the reduction, the length of stay, which is the green one, starts dropping. And the point is, if you end up with a particular problem of the specialist in that area, well, we hope you'll do better, but your length of stay is certainly be less. And uh, this is something that makes sense. So this is just one hospital matter, but you know, other you know, hospitals do something similar. This is Max. Yeah. Uh, we're just presenting, I suppose, a couple of the preliminary findings from the patient experience survey. Um, the four people that had to complete this, um, we had pages and pages of questions. So there's a huge amount of data in the survey that we did. And as Adina pointed out, um, we did get over 200 respondents, which is fantastic given the depth of the questionnaire that, that um, I think we've really 
40, 50 questions in us. So there was a lot of, of um, there was a lot of data generated, and we will be publishing more detailed findings later in the year. But I suppose just to just to give a summary of, of um, the overall experience, again, like typically like our health service, once you get in, the experience is positive. So. There's a couple of things we were we were always concerned and we really we wanted to do this um, survey in collaboration with the neurology program because we're getting a lot of reports from our members about concerns um, that patients have. And again, what we're seeing is people are very happy with the service and the good to it, but that feeling that everybody is under pressure, that the neurologists and the health and social care professionals are doing their best, but people are feeling they're feeling under pressure in their appointments. They're, they're concerned about the, the length of time to, to, their, to their next follow-up appointment. And that's really a feeling that's increasing. People are reporting that increasing over the last five years. The length of time between their appointments is getting longer, and they feel rushed at appointments. And overall, the, the sense is of the service under pressure. But as I say, a, a lot of positive aspects, and we're going to go to slide on, on communication there in, um, in a couple of moments. Um, but again, overall, quite positive levels of, of satisfaction overall with neurology services, people at their last appointment and overall experiences neurology services. Um, uh, here we go, these are communication slides. And again, a lot of, our, a lot of positives here. Uh, once people are in the, in the service, communi information communicated clearly, reasons for giving meds communicated clearly, um, people had enough time, um, the reasons for treatment communicated clearly. I and mean, one of the things we did come up with, which we'll explore a little bit in the report that we, which is hopefully later this year in collaboration with the program, <laughs> uh, concern about the patients not being given the, the details of a patient organization at the time of their diagnosis. Now, whether uh, uh, we ask people then, well, do you feel you were ready for that information? Would you have liked to have that information? And a lot of people coming back saying, yes, I would have liked it, but I didn't get it. So we want to explore a little bit why that's happening. I just comment that I think it's often looking at the last slide there, the bottom graph, comprehensive information that patients have given is lowish, about 60%. I think this probably we need to think about integrating care here because uh, often this is outpatient based. The patient, let's say they've got Parkinson's, they land in for a half an hour assessment clinic in, the, in just one day of the year, and then the rest of the 64 days of the year they're not there. So that's a problem. We don't think have a link out and outreach to it. So we have to think about that, how we do it. I do think that the, one of the key positions here would be these advanced nurse practitioners that the minister is appointing in different specialties, but it hasn't done so neurology. And I can't think of another specialty where an advanced nurse practitioner would have more benefit. We have them in epilepsy with a huge difference, not just for our inpatient, but it's that the phone call in, I have a question about my medication, what's the story with it, could this be a side effect? And it's really effective, but it also gives patients major support when they see the clinic, and those nurses can then run clinics themselves, as Adina highlighted earlier. So they're seeing a patient in you, and at the follow-up appointment, because you've got so many more to see, can be stretched out, and they have a nurse-led clinic appointment between times, and the patient gets that support, and a phone call in. And we have a number of clinical specialists, but we think we should move on to advanced nurse practitioner. When you audited that, uh, over one month, our nurses took 600 phone calls. None of those patients ended up in casualty, and none ended up in outpatients. It was all dealt with by phone. Uh, just before I let Dina move on to the rest of us, because I know she's a, a good few slides too, um, just to say on foot of this, um, the, the Neurological Alliance is launching an Invest in Neurology campaign. Um, tomorrow, all the details are going to be on nai.ie, and um, Tim has kindly agreed to be spokesperson for that campaign. Just before I forget to say that for the end no, I was just going to jump in there around the advanced nurse practitioners and epilepsy. One thing we're trying to look at this year is a proper economic evaluation of the service. Like I was saying, how many um, potential admissions were avoided? Like within epilepsy, they do outreach into other services like residential services, and there's four or five hundred patients seen through that service um, a year, and each of them didn't have to come into a hospital environment. Um, so we're hoping that, that will strengthen our case for trying to get advanced nurse practitioners within neurology. Um, yeah, this was just the, the issue that I flagged. And again, um, overall, the feeling was done appropriately or somewhat appropriately. And again, we always concerned about the percentage that felt it was done inappropriately. And again, the, the issue that we want to explore further and say, we'll be bringing the detailed findings out later this year of the population experience survey, and the issue of not getting the details that the, the relevant patients were organization. 
Yeah, this is a tough one, I often think. I mean, we're often giving bad news, and uh, that's, uh, it's difficult for any person to do that, whoever it is, doctor, nurse, or whatever. Um, and I'm sure it, it varies person to person what they need, yeah, but sometimes it's very hard, and uh, people aren't happy. You know, if you're telling me you've got motor neuron disease, or you've got bad Parkinson's, or you've got something, a frontotemporal dementia, it's tough. And uh, so it's actually a process, and it comes down to time. You need time to be able to give the patient, the family, the carers in the discussion. And then in a busy clinic when you're under pressure and you're short staffed, that's hard. So this is a tough one actually, and it's not an easy nut to crack. And I think there will always be people unhappy with it, no matter what you do, but I think we can be better than we are, or we are, I should say, but it is a tough area. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't. And sometimes, frankly, you can never get it right. The patient's always going to be dissatisfied, no matter what you do. One of the things we worked on in the program of collaboration with yourselves is the protocol for communicating the diagnosis. I know that's something to go with. Yep. Right, just to finish off, um, I suppose we started off giving a bit of information about the neurology program on the badge and what we've been doing. So the big kind of thing that we've really worked on over the last year or two has been the model of care. Um, we did the National Survey of Neurology Centres with NAI as well. We do manage to secure significant funding for a centralized um, budget for high cost MS stroke. So previously, um, hospitals were capped in terms of the number of patients they could give um, both uh, Lamtrada and Tysabri to. Um, that, has, that has changed now where the medication is given based on clinical need and not local budget at all. Um, the National Patient Experience Survey, which we'll be working on with MAI as well over the next few months to try to pull together the learning from it and try and identify areas that we should be focusing our attention on. And then just in the last few weeks, we've heard we have got funding to develop an all-island DBS service, which is long overdue. It would mean that patients will get an MDT approach for um, pre-operative and post-operative care with surgery of the Belfast, so we won't have to travel by aeroplane or around Europe, um, which should make that intervention a lot more accessible for a lot more people. I just comment there. I think education is the thing I'd add to that list, perhaps we should have added. We, do, we have been trying to push hard to make sure that we recognize that education technology is important to have and sponsor and organize a number of teaching sessions. The model of care, I point out, yeah, we were asked to put that together before any funding would be given, so that did eventually get published. It's probably about two years back. It's been frustrating, frankly, that there has not been enough engagement within the system, the program's office, nor the HSC to actually move that forward. So there's a clear blueprint here for how we should develop neurology services over the next decade, but it's actually hard to try and get them to move on that on an annual basis. It's all laid out. So if anybody's got any contacts or pressure with the Department of Health, HSC ministers, push it. The model care is there. Let's activate it. <laughs> Pretty, that's pretty much it. I mean, we, we do completely acknowledge that even if we got money tomorrow to fill all the books that we would need to deliver a fully developed neurology service, we wouldn't be able to fill those books. There's not enough people out there, there's not enough neurologists or clinical nurse specialists or OTs, physios, speech therapists, neuropsychologists. We know that this is going to be on a phase basis, but it would be good to see the phase one start. <laughs> I should point out, I mean, some of the things we managed to do actually through the acute hospitals with Colin Henry to be very supportive. So the actual the funding for the MS drugs was really important uh, because it was a peculiar system. If you live beside a certain hospital, you can get your MS drugs. If you live beside a different hospital, you couldn't. So this is completely unequitable around the country and depending on where you live. So that didn't work. Uh, so that was a, a significant achievement. I think our numbers were always going up and the patients seeing access has improved not perfect, but better. And they all aren't deep brain simulation service. It's a nice north-south mission. I think that's going to make a difference for patients. So they won't have to travel abroad repeatedly for the DBS, for Parkinson's and tremors. So I think that's achievement. But these are piecemeal. It's not a structured, and the, the structure's there, the plan is there. It just needs to get recognition. This is worthwhile. There's more, a lot of work done by the Yeah, the system, we're a working group, a very active working group actually, um, which 
Foundation I'm a part of, and that's been, I should acknowledge them, they've done a significant body of work. If you the model of care document, that's a ghastly 350 page document on the HSE website that um, we tried to trim down, but it kept getting bigger. But uh, the executive summary is not bad, it's a terse five page, I'd recommend that. Uh, but the other stuff is, is very detailed. But you know, it's there and it's, it can easily be followed. But uh, I suppose brain is important, and we haven't persuaded the uh, state of the country yet. It all starts tomorrow. It all kicks off tomorrow with the investment or all this campaign. And I'll give it another, yet another plug. Thank you for listening to Anadina for their